Welcome to the Sidewalk Weekly Podcast, a show for people who are big on cities but short on time. I'm Vanessa Quirk. Eric, did you hear about these new ideas for kind of post-pandemic workplaces like automatic doors, so you don't have to touch knobs or buttons, and kind of these barriers between desks? You know, I, I wonder why you raised that given that we sit next to each other and have desks that are side by side. Why would you need a barrier exactly? I've, I've been longing for a fence for a while. Has <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing been a kind of elaborate scheme by you to, to have a barrier between our desks? I mean, I don't see why considering we're working from home. So only if this whole thing was a scheme by me to make us everybody work from home. I, I remember when even the brand new employee got an office of his or her own. Whoa, wait, wait, what, what, what year did every person get an office when they started work? This is true, though. Um, in the early 2000s, at least when I kind of... No. You know, there wasn't, you know, open plan offices. Relatively new thing. Last 10 Eric, years you're a so. dinosaur. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> um, and uh, with that, we will welcome you, city lovers. This is the Sidewalk Weekly. I'm Eric Jaffe. We'll spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the biggest stories from the urban tech world this week. Our first segment looks at three top stories. We give them five minutes each, and when time's up, you hear a little bicycle bell. This week, our top stories explore what COVID is teaching us about fighting pollution, how dense cities can recover from the pandemic, and whether it's time to end industrial zoning. Okay, let's start with that pollution story. First story comes from The New Yorker, where Raghu Karnad is writing about the shocking improvement in air quality that's happened during the lockdown in India. Um, and now northern India has is home to 21 of the 30 most polluted cities in the world. So this is a very big deal. And Raghu wonders whether these cities and really all cities around the world can use this momentum to fight pollution after COVID. Well, Vanessa, what do you think? Well, I definitely think that would be an amazing outcome of all of this, if possible. But I'm just going to set a little bit of context here so people understand, you know, why this is such a big deal. I think in the news lately, we've been coming more familiar with the fact that air pollution does have a pretty direct impact on people's ability to recover from COVID. And that's because air pollution in general has a huge link to people's health, which is something that we've been reading more and more about over the months and years, right? So WHO actually has linked pollution, and that's specifically a type of particulate matter called PM2.5, to around 100,000 deaths in India each year. And that stat, unfortunately, is is referring to children younger than five. Wow. So that is shocking and tragic. And Raghu writes that before COVID, the first thing he would do every morning is check his phone to see the air quality ratings, right? And if it was at max warning level, he might not go to work or something that day. And, and many Indians, even before COVID, were going around wearing these N95 masks to protect themselves from this pollution, and these particulates. Yeah, I mean, it's really astonishing. But, but the declines that they're seeing now, those are almost equally astonishing in, in a good sense. Raghu is kind of shocked by what he's been seeing during the lockdown, the PM 2.5 count has dropped 71 percent. He's writing that, you know, people can go on their balconies and see mountains that they've never seen before, like new peaks that they are not new, but old peaks that they've never been able to see. And researchers are also now in a kind of golden opportunity right now because they can start to parse out what is actually causing pollution and what isn't. And Raghu cites uh, some researchers who had said, you know, before cities would often point the finger at other regions and say, you know, they're the ones responsible. But now they're seeing very clearly how much pollution cities are causing themselves. And it's and often through car traffic. So they're at this kind of remarkable moment where they can really identify where it's coming from and, and its impact. Now the question is, what do we do about it, right? I mean, Raghu's asking why India and, you know, and frankly, the rest of the world isn't acting with the same urgency around air pollution as we have towards COVID. He kind of posits two major reasons. One is the equity element. He's saying the wealthy in India, you know, they can afford home air filters and things that protect them. And the other reason he kind of cites is that there's, you know, there's no single shot solution to pollution. Assuming we don't want to have a whole shutdown with the economy like we're having right now, you need to have systemic change. And that's really difficult to bring about. Yeah, there are precedents of this, of acting at a time when we didn't have to have a global 
shutdown of everything. Beijing, before the 2008 Summer Olympics, you know, really curbed their pollution. And when they finished that and they got out of that and they started resuming business as usual, people were like, hey, I really liked it before when the air was clear. Right, right, right. Um, and they did something about it. And you saw a few years later, and I wrote a blog post about this earlier this year uh, based on a new study, you know, in 2013, China set up a new network to monitor, collect, and publish in an open way real-time air quality data. And, and what that did was, you know, you started to see entrepreneurs and innovators use that data to create new apps that warned people about pollution levels. You saw people avoid unnecessary trips, discretionary trips. They stopped taking them on days when it was really high pollution out. They changed their, their home buying behavior. They didn't want to buy homes in areas with high pollution. So you saw China did start to make big changes. Uh, of course, you know, better pollution data doesn't solve the problem, the core problem there. That requires comprehensive initiatives, of course. That is the point of, of this story. Um, but this type of investment in better data does at least improve awareness of the problem, and it's a step. And, and I'll add that this is not just an issue in India, China, and Asia, and we can do something about it. Right. I think that the real question coming out of this lockdown and people in Los Angeles seeing the lack of smog and people in India seeing the mountains, you know, will we use this as an opportunity for change? Will this be an opportunity to really bring down GHG emissions going forward now that we can see the potential benefits? All right. And that leads us into our next story. So this week, our CEO, Dan Dockdroff, wrote an op-ed in The New York Times outlining some of the near-term and long-term steps that cities can take to rebound from the pandemic, based on his own experience when he was deputy mayor of New York and helped the city recover after 9-11. So Eric, you worked with Dan on this piece. What does this rebound look like? I think I'm going to step back for a second before we get into this piece. As cities start to think about what comes next, they are seeing signs that they're starting to flatten the curve, really positive and encouraging signs. They obviously have to make sure they're confident in those signs. But local governments will start to decide whether or not to lift these restrictions. Right. And there won't be a blanket solution, a one-size-fits-all solution. Maybe there will be regional ones. But, you know, we went back to history this week, and, and I looked at a city that had the worst health outcomes during the 1918 flu pandemic, and that was Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of factors that contributed to this outcome, including pollution, actually. We, we mentioned that in the last segment. Um, but one of the things that was really clear was that politics, not the public health recommendations, were what drove Pittsburgh to end its social gathering restrictions. And it did so prematurely, you could say, at least a week sooner than the state officials, the public health officials, wanted them to do that. You know, and ultimately, they, they paid a bit of a price for this. There were clear flare-ups in cases and deaths related to the flu after that. Yeah, and you make the point in the blog post that not only did they have this new spike in deaths from the disease, but also it didn't even really positively impact the economy in the end either. Because when you compare Pittsburgh to Cleveland, for example, which did keep their restrictions in place for about a week longer than Pittsburgh, they, at the end of the day, had better job growth through 1919. So, I mean, it's hard to know exactly if it was a result of that, but yeah. at least for Pittsburgh, it didn't even have the economic benefit that they assumed it would. Yeah. And, and lots of other cities fell into the same camp. So, you know, again, we're not saying this needs to last indefinitely. Obviously, it should end as soon as safely possible. But once we clear that hurdle, that, that brings us kind of back to your original question of, of what a rebound might look like. And, you know, as Dan was thinking about this, in the short term, at least, it's really about restoring confidence in density, right? We keep hearing, mm. is this the end of cities? Is this the end of gathering and crowding? I think we certainly on this show agree it's not, but there will be that concern. And so after 9-11, they had similar concerns around public safety. That was a terrorist attack, obviously. They held gatherings for people that were safe and secure in Times Square. They hosted conventions to bring, you know, global leaders to the city to show this place was safe. We're back open for business. The focus now, Dan says, at least in the near term, needs to be on doing the same thing for public health. 
Yeah. And he he offers some really interesting examples of the kinds of initiatives that you could start seeing in New York. Things like more visible hygiene programs. So that would be, you know, having hand sanitizers out in public, mass distribution, temperature checks in public places, way more sanitized trains and buses, you know, measures to reduce crowding. Also staggered business hours, which I think you wrote in 1918 was pretty yeah. effective, for example. He also brings up pandemic preparation. So having stockpiles of protective equipment, perhaps ventilators, right? And having a robust testing infrastructure, which will be critical. And he also brings up health tech initiatives, data that could help public health officials detect and track outbreaks in a, in a privacy preserving way. So all of those things would allow for a short term improvement in public health infrastructure. Exactly. And then I think, you know, once those things are in place, you can start to look at more long term initiatives. And Dan was saying he felt very strongly about this. I know we talked a lot about it. We have an opportunity here to really reset and change the way we approach urban development. After 9-11, they did a great job in New York recruiting businesses back into the city, expanding the tax base, creating new developments. But it led to some of the challenges the city's facing today in terms of affordability, uh, harmful gentrification. A lot of cities are suffering from these things. So do we have this chance, this opportunity, this moment to reset the conversation and pursue a much bolder model of urban development that is focused on inclusion, sustainability, and resilience. And Dan would say, yes, we focus on things like housing affordability, aggressive climate initiatives, new resiliency efforts. We do have that chance to do things in a better and brighter way. Right. And I know we're running short on time here, but there is one final thing that Dan brings up that he thinks would be really important moving forward, which is creating a kind of consortium of folks who can really come together to plan ahead in this more inclusive, sustainable and resilient manner, like you say. And and he refers back to 2007 to Plan YC, which was a similar effort to really bring together a lot of people from across private public sector and think about what is the future of New York in a sustainable framework. So that would really be the kind of model that Dan sees that could work as New York City starts to plan ahead for its future. All right. Our final top story this week comes from the Urbanist blog, and it's Ray Dubicki, who's writing the first in a, in a multi-part series about the future of zoning, whether or not industrial zoning still has a future in our cities. What do you think, Vanessa? Does it? I think it could, which I'm kind of excited about, but I'm just going to step back a little bit and explain why that I think and Ray thinks that that sounds like a good idea when clearly on the face of it, you might say like, hey, why on earth would you want industry in cities? I mean, there's been a long history of cities purposely trying to get industry out of kind of neighborhood cores, pushing factories and and other types of industrial uses to the remote edges of cities. And there is good reason for that, right? You don't want factories that create pollution, for example, to be next door to a school or next door <laughs> right. to your house, right? That said, I think Ray brings up two really good points. I'm just going to read a quote, actually, because I think this is he says it really nicely. Zoning has never stopped pollution. It's only shunted undesirable uses to more racially segregated or less politically connected areas. What has stopped pollution is strong regulation, enforcement, and monitoring. These are vastly better at controlling pollution than the blunt tool of zoning, no matter where a use is placed. That, first of all, is a, is a really excellent point. It's not that pollution is is going away. It's just getting moved to places where often more vulnerable people are being exposed to the brunt of it, right? So that is that is a great point. The other point that he makes is that, you know, industry has changed. And today, there are a lot of zoning law that pro- prohibits certain types of industrial uses that really wouldn't be damaging to the people around them, right? I mean, he's talking about a glass blowing shop might be allowed, but not an on-demand printing shop, when really both of them would be equally potentially beneficial to a neighborhood and not have terribly negative ramifications. So I think this is what he's he's trying to get at, is that we have to really rethink the way that we're zoning when it comes to industry. Yeah. And he gives another great example of breweries, right? We've seen a rise in craft breweries in cities. These are naturally zoned as industrial uses, but they're actually really social spaces. You want people to be able to come in and socialize, at least, you know, once distancing's done, you want them to live near that. 
that and to congregate in those areas. Yeah, we need those beers. <laughs> yeah, and, and like the thing is, actually, if you push those things to the edges of a city, people might drive there, and so you're undermining your own potential solution around the zoning. So. Right. I think he's bringing the point there that we want to have really walkable neighborhoods and you want to have things like breweries in a distance that people don't have to drive to. Right. And Dubicki does obviously make the point, you know, you can't have every type of industry in neighborhood cores, but he does give examples of four types of businesses that really could easily be integrated into residential and commercial neighborhoods. So back of the store manufacturing. So like a brewery a candy shop that makes its own candy which sounds really nice yeah, to have in my neighborhood. Mm. Smart manufacturing companies. So for example, 3D printing, and that wouldn't be big, loud industrial machines. So that would be kind of allowable under his thinking. Companies that do distribution. So for example, neighborhood logistics hubs that store goods so that shopkeepers can have a kind of a more lean retail presence. And the final category he, he states is recreation. So things like bowling alleys, which believe it or not, can often be categorized as industrial. And clearly we would want those kinds of bowling alleys in our neighborhoods. So all of those are examples of industrial uses that could very happily live side by side with homes and businesses. Yeah. And safely too. And I think that's the key here. And at Sidewalk, we've put together ideas around a, a concept called outcome-based zoning. The idea is it's the outcome of a use that matters. It is not the type of use itself. So if you had a 3D printer, say, but it didn't exceed a certain noise threshold, why not have the use there? If you had a certain manufacturer, but it didn't exceed a certain air quality threshold, why not have it in, in a mixed use community? And so if you set those thresholds and you monitor them through the type of environmental non-personal sensors that exist today, you could have that strong regulation, enforcement, and monitoring without prescribed exclusion of certain types of uses. Okay, that is all we have time for. And as always, you can find the links to the stories that we talked about today in our podcast episode notes. In our next segment, we are going to talk with Nusha Gailey. She's the co-founder of an epidemiology startup, and we are going to talk about sewage surveillance. Back in a sec. We are now joined by Nusha Gailey. She's the co-founder of an epidemiology startup called Biobot, based in Boston, which is studying trends of the COVID outbreak in the city's wastewater supply to try and help public officials stay ahead of the disease. Nusha, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Nusha, thank you for taking the time. You know, we spoke a couple of years ago at that time. Biobot was focused on the opioid crisis. We have a new crisis today, unfortunately, with COVID. Can you... Explain a bit for our listeners of how wastewater analysis can help health officials in a general sense track diseases. Absolutely. So at a very high level, our work is called wastewater epidemiology. And the concept behind wastewater epidemiology is that everybody pees and poops every day. Uh, and we know that urine and stool contain a lot of information on human health and well-being. Our doctors look at it all the time. And every day we're parting with this information and we're flushing it down the toilet where it's aggregating in our city sewers. Now, we know that some diseases are also excreted in urine or stool. So our position at Biobot is that sewage is really a community or a city level urine and stool sample. And we have built technology to collect and analyze this data in sewage. So how does a public official take that information and go from there? So specifically with our coronavirus product, which is measuring the SARS-CoV-2 virus in, in sewage, this data is really helpful to public health officials in measuring the scope of the outbreak independent from patient testing or hospital reporting. So we know that patient tests are limited. There's only so many to go around. And so this is hugely beneficial in complementing that data in capturing the entire population. Mm, right. And I'd say the other component where this data becomes very helpful is in guiding decision makers on some of these critical policy questions on when should we open up our cities again? Mm. Hmm. So in real time or on a daily or weekly basis, being able to get that snapshot of how many individuals are infected in a community. And so when are we nearing a point where it's safe to open up our communities again? And just drawing on that, I know you were co-author of a study 
You were looking at signs of COVID in Boston's wastewater supply, and you found way more evidence of the virus in that wastewater supply than had been found or at least reported in clinical testing, right? What does that mean in terms of next steps? Yeah. So at the time that the samples were collected, which I believe was March 25th in Massachusetts, in the area, in the region that we that we sampled, there were about 450 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Now, Our data, our analysis based on sewage indicates that up to 5% of the population that lives in that catchment has COVID. And that represents about 100,000 individuals. Now, that's the upper end of our estimate. So the paper actually gives a range in terms of the estimated number of cases. But there's a huge difference there or discrepancy there. And I think Largely, that could be for a couple of reasons. First, that a lot of individuals who might be sick aren't getting tested or don't have access to tests and are just managing the illness at home. And second, that there is an asymptomatic population, likely a very large asymptomatic population or population with mild symptoms that are just not being captured in the healthcare system. So I saw that you have recently launched a pro bono effort to collect samples from across the U.S. and hopefully cover about 5% of the population. So can you, first of all, just explain, you know, why are you undertaking that that effort? And also, what steps should cities and local governments also be taking to understand more about how the disease is spreading? Mm -hmm. The basic question that we want to help communities answer is, is my city getting better or worse and how fast? And that's very important when thinking about, again, how do we start to open up our communities again? We know that a lot of these quarantine measures have large economic ramifications and obviously have huge implications for city life in general. So this data can potentially be very valuable in helping us understand when to restore things. In addition to that, Having a system like this in place as a permanent infrastructure layer in our cities can help as an early warning ahead of any other peaks of this outbreak that we may or may not have. It's still a question whether or not coronavirus is going to be seasonal. So for example, if it does end up being seasonal, this could be an early warning for its emergence in a community down the line. Right. Last one, Nusha, and we'll let you go. Obviously, we've seen cities deprioritize public health investment over the years. Do you think in the aftermath of COVID that will change and will see cities once again start to prioritize their public health programs? Well, I definitely hope so. You know, our vision at BioBot is to make public health more data driven, more proactive and ultimately more effective by leveraging wastewater. And we imagine that one day this will be a permanent infrastructure layer in our cities and it will be routine to make public health and policy decisions based on wastewater data. Well, let's hope that future comes soon. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Nusha. We really appreciate your time at this very busy Thank moment. Thank you, for Nusha. You. Hope you're staying safe. Thank you. It's now time for our final segment The Last Smile. In this segment, we set aside the depressing news of the week and we focus on something happy for a minute each. Eric, what made you smile this week? All right. So for me this week, it was a story in Colossal by Christopher Jobson. And he's writing about when Banksy works from home. So Banksy obviously is is the very famous urban artist who's known for a lot of his work, spray painting, fantastic paintings on the side of buildings through the cloak of darkness and no one's ever unveiled him. Or, or, I mean, we don't actually know if it's a hint, That's do we? That's true, we don't. Although this, <laughs> this story suggests it might be. Although we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. <laughs> what we do know is that Banksy is quarantined just like the rest of us and kind of has to work from home and cannot go out into the city, which is his or her natural canvas. And so Banksy put up on Instagram a few images of artwork in their own bathroom at home. And so it's rats swinging from towel racks, running on toilet paper, (laughs) kind of making a mess of the toilet. And the caption says, my wife hates it when I work from home. Uh, Mine too, Banksy, but for other reasons. (laughs) All right, Vanessa, what, what made you smile this week? 
So this week, I very much enjoyed an article, and I'm almost upset that I have to tell you about it because I was really hoping that I could have surprised you with it at a future (laughs) moment. Paige Luskin, writing in Business Insider, is profiling a really wonderful initiative called Goat to Meeting. The idea is that for, I think, about $100 or so, you can have a goat or a llama from this Silicon Valley farm called Sweet Farm actually attend your virtual oh work boy. from home meeting. Uh-huh. So yeah, I mean, I personally think that every meeting should include a goat or a llama. So silver lining of COVID. I you mean, know? do we know which is more productive, a goat or a llama? I mean, because that, that matters to business. I think it's got to be goats. It's they got a lot be. of spring in their step. They, they've got energy. They're bouncing. I feel like llamas are just more of the, you know, take it easy <laughs> type uh, All right, llamas, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and our time is up this week. So thank you for joining us. If you want to read the stories that we discussed today and many more, then you should sign up for the Sidewalk Weekly newsletter at SidewalkLabs.com. We should note, as always, that the views expressed in the Sidewalk Weekly don't necessarily reflect Sidewalk's company position. And if you think we're missing a perspective or want us to talk about something, then you should let us know. Send us an email or a voice memo to podcast at sidewalklabs.com, and we might just talk about it in a future episode. The Sidewalk Weekly is produced by Vanessa and me. Uh, Vanessa does the editing. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions, and our art is by the great Tim Cow. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.